A Touch of Frost, Friday at 9. Now tell the truth, have you ever pretended to be your favourite star? Well, if you have, this is the show for you. Five star guests have swapped their hairbrushes for microphones and their mirrors for cameras. In order to say the immortal words... Tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be... So who would you be? Stars in their eyes, Saturday, 6.45. Welcome back to Wednesday on Grampian, where there are highlights of tonight's Champions League games at 11.30. First though, the news. Railtrack admits crash line wasn't good as Chief Executive resigns. Scotland says final farewell to Donald Dewar. Manchester United exact revenge for past European defeat. And a night at the opera for the Queen in Italy. From ITN, the ITV Nightly News, with Dermot Murnahan. Good evening. The board of Railtrack have been debating tonight whether to accept the resignation of their chief executive, Gerald Corbett, over the Hatfield rail crash. He said he was distraught about the tragedy. And it now looks very much as if a broken rail was to blame. That section of track was to have been replaced next month. Speed restrictions were today imposed on a hundred other similar bends right across the rail network. Here's Caroline Kerr. Tonight, as crash investigators completed a second day's work at the site of yesterday's accident, rail track admitted that the condition of the track on that part of the line was not good. The day had begun with the confirmation that the inquiry was now focusing on the possibility that a broken track could have caused the accident. This is an issue about how a five-year-old piece of rail has failed in a catastrophic manner and did it fail before the accident, during the accident or as a consequence of the accident. So what do we know about the track at Hatfield? At five years old it was relatively new. Experts say it should have lasted 30 years. The track was last worked on in September. Repairs were carried out to improve ride quality on the trains and crucially it was due to be replaced in a matter of weeks. While the Hatfield track was relatively new, critics say the whole network suffers from a historic lack of investment. There was a long period during the middle 90s when the, the railways were being privatised, when the government wouldn't let British Rail or Rail Track, when it was in the public sector, wouldn't let them spend enough uh, on new rails, and that's where the rot set in. Today, the suggestion that a faulty track could have caused the crash led Rail Track's chief executive, Gerald Corbett, to offer his resignation. He said he was distraught that another rail tragedy had occurred. But this afternoon, a survivor who suffered terrible burns in the Paddington crash, in which 31 people died, said nothing would be achieved by getting rid of Gerald Corbett. For a chief executive to resign at a particularly horrendous time such as this, and a new person to come in, we fail to see how that achieves anything. Rail operators, who are clearly relieved that their rolling stock was not to blame for yesterday's tragedy, added their support for Railtrack's chief executive. He's brought fresh air and energy to this industry. He's fought for the important things. I deeply regret that he is considering uh, resigning, that he's tendered his resignation, but it's a measure of the man that he's done so. This evening, relatives of those who died made the painful pilgrimage to the site where their loved ones were killed. They were named as Steve Arthur from West Sussex, who was married with two children, Peter Monkhouse from Leeds, and Leslie Gray from Nottingham. Meanwhile, in central London, rail track executives arrived for a crisis meeting at the company's headquarters to decide whether to accept Gerald Corbett's resignation. Tonight, they failed to reach any conclusion, at least publicly, though an announcement is expected early tomorrow morning. In the meantime, Rail track have imposed a blanket speed ban on any section of track similar to that at the Hatfield crash site. It's an attempt to persuade the travelling public that it is still safe to use Britain's railways. Caroline Kerr, ITN, at Rail track headquarters. The Israeli and Palestinian authorities both made moves today to implement the truce agreed yesterday. But the Israeli Prime Minister, back from Sharm el-Sheikh, said he still wasn't convinced Israel had a partner for peace. A fear apparently borne out in the West Bank today. John Irvine reports. 
for the Palestinians, the sacrifice has been so great that they cannot abandon their uprising, and that means continuing to take to the streets. Ceasefire terms may have been agreed across the negotiating table, but it's the response here on the ground that matters. This was an organized march to a recognized flashpoint. The new day may have brought a new truce, but it was short-lived. Each side said the onus was on the other to prevent this happening, but neither did enough, and an afternoon of violence ensued. These are sights and sounds that will dismay the peacemakers. Despite the best efforts of some of the most powerful people on earth, calm has not been restored to the streets of the West Bank. The Israelis used large amounts of tear gas. They fired dozens of canisters. A more restrained response, perhaps, but nonetheless effective in repelling the rioters. Earlier today in Ramallah, the Israelis arrested several Palestinians in connection with last week's lynching of two soldiers. There's been no sign of a truce elsewhere in the occupied territories, and more than 50 Palestinians have been injured. No one expected the trouble to end at a stroke, but the ceasefire deal and subsequent calls for calm appear to have gone unnoticed. The Israelis have given the truce 48 hours to take root. After that, they say they will consider their options. John Arvine, ITN, on the West Bank. Here, three of the big supermarkets have increased their petrol prices today for the first time since the fuel blockades. Sainsbury, Tesco and Safeway all added two pence per litre, taking the average price of a litre of unleaded petrol to 79.9 pence. The Financial Times is reporting that all the other major retailers are expected to follow suit. The funeral of Donald Dewar, Scotland's first First Minister, filled the cathedral and streets of Glasgow today. There were many affectionate tributes, Gordon Brown remembering him as a great and good man who changed Scotland and Britain for the better. Harry Smith reports. It was at the cathedral in the heart of his beloved Glasgow that they gathered to say goodbye to Donald Dewar. The guest list, headed by the Prince of Wales, included leaders from across the world of politics and many who simply knew the First Minister as a friend. There was his close family, daughter Marion and son Ian with their families. And all around, the people of Glasgow, grieving the loss of a leader they regarded as one of their own. The Prime Minister read the lesson from Isaiah. On video screens in his constituency, they listened as tributes were paid, both political and personal. Heath more than anyone, fashioned Scotland's old democratic instincts into the modern democratic institution. He changed both Scotland and Britain irreversibly and for the better. He came sporting a tie with a YSL motif, a breakthrough, I surmised. Yves Saint Laurent had finally persuaded him of the merits of designer chic. Not at all, he retorted. He'd been presented with it by Yarrow Shipbuilders Limited. <laughs> To the strains of an old Scots ballad, the coffin was carried from the church. As it made its way to a private cremation, hundreds lined the streets to pay their last respects. Along the route, the university where Mr. Dewar began his political career. Harry Smith, ITN, Glasgow. Democratic and Republican candidates for American President Al Gore and George W. Bush have had their third and last television debate. Straw polls suggested that this time Vice President Gore just edged it. Our Washington correspondent James Mates reports. There are less than three weeks to go now. This is the beginning of the end of this campaign, their last opportunity before a nationwide audience. All right, here we go again. Now look. It is Gore who's coming from behind, Gore who must change the dynamics of this race, Gore who was both aggressive and passionate. I think we should make it the number one priority to make our schools the best in the world, all of them. At one point, as George Bush spoke, Gore approached him almost menacingly. But can you get things done? And I believe I can. Bush is considered to have won the first two debates by coming over as the more reasonable, more likable candidate. He tried the same again. When you total up all the federal spending he wants to do, 
it's the largest increase in federal spending in years. And there's just not going to be enough money. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm so glad that I have a chance to knock that down. The Gore camp said their man was not looking for a knockout blow tonight, but he's aware he came off worse in both the first two debates and has certainly been a lot more assertive this evening. But it's a risky strategy as to whether it makes him look more like a president or like a bully. The contrast in styles was summed up in their final remarks. Gore reworking a Reagan battle cry. You ain't seen nothing yet. Bush ending with a self-deprecating joke. For those of you for me, thanks for your help. For those of you for my opponent, please only vote once. But maybe nothing here to break the deadlock in the polls. James Mates, ITN, St. Louis, Missouri. The cable television company NTL has pulled out of a multi-million pound pay-per-view deal with the Premier League. The American company was to have paid £328 million to screen 40 matches a year for three years starting next season. It said it was very disappointed it hadn't been able to complete the deal on satisfactory terms. In the European Champions League tonight, a full-strength Manchester United got their revenge on PSV Eindhoven, beating them 3-1 at Old Trafford. Leeds United drew nil all with Besiktas in a mercifully trouble-free match in Turkey. Graham Miller reports. Manchester United needed a win at Old Trafford to keep their European Cup hopes alive, so Sir Alex Ferguson picked his strongest available 11 and it paid off within nine minutes. Watch Teddy Sheringham, a gift for him on current form, a great header for his eighth goal of the season. With United looking in charge, a second goal seemed inevitable. Ryan Giggs did the hard part, but Sheringham somehow missed out this time. Same story in the second half, but this time the crossbar kept out Ronnie Johnson's header. Then United seemed to relax and they paid the price. Sylvester's header fell to Mark Van Bommel and suddenly PSV were level. But United are nothing if not experienced at this level. Sylvester made amends with the cross as they stepped up the pace and Paul Scholes was on hand to put United back in front. And they finished things off with the third in the closing minutes. Dwight York ran in his first goal of the season to put United top of Group G. In Istanbul, meantime, there was an undercurrent of intimidation for Leeds as they faced Besiktas just six months after two of their fans were murdered in the city. Ian Hart's free kick almost led to a Leeds winner. Baduka flicked it on for Eric Bakker, but the Norwegian shot straight at the keeper. A goal then after five minutes would have silenced the home crowd. But Leeds held on for a point, which means a win against Barcelona next week would put them through to the next phase. Graham Miller, ITN Sport. And highlights of all tonight's Champions League games will be on ITV after this news. On her Italian tour, the Queen left Rome today after a walkabout and flew north to Milan. She's had a night at its opera house, which staged a special concert in her honour. Our royal correspondent Libby Vino reports. The famous La Scala Opera House was sold out in anticipation of the Queen's arrival in Milan. And there was loud applause as she entered the royal box for a gala concert. Two short pieces of music had been chosen, one by Sir Edward Elgar. Earlier in Rome, the Queen was taken to a spectacular new vantage point to view the famous Forum. Even someone for whom home is a palace couldn't fail to be impressed. Then it was time for ordinary Italians to catch a glimpse of the Queen as she went on her first walkabout of the tour. Later in Milan, the spectacle of royalty was also proving the big draw for the rich and famous concert goers at La Scala. After her warm reception in Rome, Milan tonight put on its finery for the Queen. She may not be known as a maker of fashion, but Italy's style capital has welcomed her as one of its own. Libby Vina, ITN, Milan. 
The headlines again, a broken rail is now thought to have caused the Hatfield rail crash yesterday which killed four people. Rail track admitted that the condition of that section of track was not good and the rail track board have been deciding tonight whether to accept the resignation of their chief executive, Gerald Corbett. And there were more clashes in the West Bank and Gaza today despite attempts by the Israeli and Palestinian authorities to implement yesterday's truce. Tonight's financial figures, the 100 share index down more than 180 points at one stage, recovered to close 55 points lower. On Wall Street, the Dow finished nearly 115 points down, and the pound is trading just over a quarter of a cent lower against the dollar. And now let's take a look at tomorrow's papers. And once again, most are dominated by the Hatfield rail crash. The Times claims rail track knew the line was in poor condition 10 months ago. It pictures Pam Warren, who survived the Paddington disaster and who's urging the head of rail track to stay on. The Telegraph also claims the company knew about the state of the track before the crash. It says trains should not have been allowed to travel down that line. It pictures Gordon Brown with his wife Sarah at Donald Dewar's funeral. The Guardian warns that there could be similar faults elsewhere around the country. It pictures a broken rail at the Hatfield site. The Mirror also uses a picture of damaged track and reports rail track's description of the track as not good. The paper says in its view the state of the track was in fact absolutely bloody scandalous. And the Sun meanwhile leads on the trouble that Liz Hurley ran into in Hollywood last night for breaking an actors union strike. And that's it for me for now. I'll be here again tomorrow at 11 from all the team with the ITV 